for a number of you, welcome back for the CCC weekend with Pastor John Hine. He serves us in our synod on the Commission on Congregational Counseling. He has a, I guess you call it a kind of a preliminary report based yep. on input from yesterday and from congregational profiles that we submitted. So we will let him take it away. Ah, thank, thank you guys for having me. I, as I was starting to write up your guys' report, so that's when I start putting the numbers and stuff together. Trinity is now 150, so a nice, I've worked with 150, uh, 150 Wells churches over the last eight years, so there should be a name for 150. What is that? Senta? It's, it's something. There's some, some name for it. But uh, um, yeah, so a self-assessment and adjustment program is, is the first uh, service that uh, congregational counseling offers. And it's just to help the congregation kind of wrap their brains around um, both internal things, what's going well in ministry, in congregational culture, what are some challenges we're facing internally, uh, but then also externally, understanding the community a little better, uh, understanding uh, uh, Watertown. We, I, I stressed uh, yesterday that we call it self-assessment and adjustment uh, um, be, because you can't expect like someone from Synod to come out in as like an outside expert and say, here's how, here's how I would do ministry. Because I don't, I mean, I went to school in Watertown, but that was like, uh, that was like a long time ago it, that, that, that I went to Northwestern. Uh, the town has changed. Like someone told me you guys had a Walmart now, and I, like that was not the case uh, back then. Um, nor do I understand the, the, the people, the skill sets that you have within Trinity. So, um, like I understood Charleston. I, f I felt like after 20 years, I kind of I knew Charleston. I, that's where I served for 20 years, Charleston, South Carolina, Mission Restart. I felt I knew it pretty well. Uh, um, but when I do the working with churches like this, it's it, it's just me listening and saying, okay, what are your ideas of how things are going and what we might try in the future? Um, and, then, and then we put a summary report together, which is where we're at. Um, so you, we had your church leaders fill out a congregational profile that kind of analyzed ministry a little bit. Uh, we had a number of your members take a pulse survey, uh, um, which was again, kind of like SWOT analysis, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats within the church. Uh, had your called workers fill out a survey. Uh, my, my office do, does the demographic work and the ethnographic work, so that's understanding, like, is there growth taking place uh, in the parish area? And when you hear me say the word parish area, parish area is 15 minutes drive from where I'm standing. So distance doesn't really matter. It's time involved in driving. You can get people to drive about 15 minutes to church. So 15 minutes from where I'm standing, we're going to call it your parish area. We've analyzed the demographics and then ethnographics. Demographics deals with um, people numbers. So like what percent of the population is four years old or younger? Ethnographics is people thoughts. How do people in this parish area feel about preschool or feel about Lutheran education? That's ethnographic work. Feel about church. Uh, uh, we studied that. Then yesterday is, uh, uh, kind of, was kind of important. That's our listening sessions, our brainstorming, where we got a group of uh, really active members together just to think about congregational culture, um, what we call vision, kind of a desired future. Where would you like Trinity to be five years from now? And we summarized some of that. I, I, I spent about six hours trying to summarize that last night. This is just a quick preliminary report. What's going to happen? is I'm gonna give you a fuller written report. Uh, it'll be ready probably mid to late January, where I'm gonna, the report's just gonna say, and, and there'll be a, a simple summary, two pages that you can put in a worship folder. There'll be a, a thicker report, 20 to 30 pages, which is more for leadership, all the details. And then if you really have insomnia, there'll be about 150 to 200 pages of underlying support uh, documents. So if you say, I'm not sure about that, I can say, well, go look at document number eight, uh, which proves, proves what, I, what I just said there. Um, so here's what I heard you say, that's kind of what the report's going to say. Then an analysis of what made sense. Um, you know, sometimes churches will put together a plan, and, and what, what I kind of have the benefit of from my position now, working with 150 churches, and really I, I analyze all the churches in Wells, is I can kind of see what's worked and what hasn't. What's made a difference when churches have tried it, and what hasn't made any difference. Uh, uh, a lot of churches say, oh, if we just do this, God's kingdom will come, and we'll exp and I'm like, no, that's... I've seen 20 churches try that and it's never made any difference. Uh, uh, um, so analysis of, of, of what I've heard you say. And then I'll provide some recommendations for next steps for Trinity goals over the course of the next, uh, uh, the next couple of years. At any time uh, during this presentation, you got a question or a comment or, or, or a thought, just raise your hand. Um, this isn't like you know yesterday where we'd have periods of breakout. You can just break in at any time with a question. So just summarizing some things we did yesterday, we, we talked about uh, the challenge before us. 
And the thing we tried to stress is, uh, um, this is not your grandfather's country anymore. And so you, people don't, Americans don't think about church the same way they did when your grandfather was, let's say, in his 20s. And because that's the case, if you conduct ministry exactly the same way as happened in your grandfather's day, it's, there's put the potential for problems, for problems there. Um, to me, the classic example, just the shift in the last 20 years, from really the founding of, of, of America till maybe 15, 20 years ago, it was culturally advantageous to identify as a Christian. So if you were a plumber, you might not really go to church, but you'd put the Jesus fish in the back of your plumbing truck. Why? Pardon me? Yeah, why? What would they assume about you? You're a Christian, so you, you're going to be honest, you're not going to cheat me. It was culturally advantageous to identify as a Christian. In the last 20 years, in a lot of professions, it has become culturally disadvantageous to identify. It's, it actually can hurt you to identify as a conservative Christian. Um, so we've just seen America's religious landscape collapsing. Uh, here's the group, this mainline group, this line here, this blue line, that we belong to, Lutherans, we be part of mainline. So you see, we peaked um, kind of in the, in the middle of the 1970s, and mainline denominations have just been on decline since then. Evangelicals, that'd be your Southern Baptists or your non-denominationals, they were big where, where I was in the Deep South. They peaked in the, in the mid-90s and have now been on decline since then. The one religious group that's been growing over the last 50 years is Americans with no religion. Uh, we talked yesterday uh, um, about how Barna, which studies American religious culture, said last year is the first year that the majority of Americans now identify as not being religious. Um, they're just completely uninterested in, in organized religion belonging to a church. Uh, um, we have to acknowledge what that means for our churches. Um, there are increasingly fewer church shoppers, therefore corporate outreach efforts are going to become increasingly ineffective. Uh, um, even when I started ministry in 97, I could just say, oh, you're looking for a church? You've got you to gotta try a beautiful Savior. Real, real nice church, uplifting message, good music. Right now, you say that to the people of Watertown, no one cares. They don't care that this is a pretty bit building or that you have good music. They're not going to come because there's, there's not church shoppers. What you're going to have to do is have a connection with the people that as, as members of our churches get to know their next door neighbors, get to know the problems in their life, your next door neighbor's marriage is breaking down, that's when you can say, you know what? My marriage would have broken down seven times over by now if it wasn't for the strength that Christ would give. Why don't you come to church with me this Sunday? That's where the rubber's gonna hit the road for our churches moving forward. If you rely on corporate outreach, well, we're gonna do mass mailing. We're gonna put on commercials. We're gonna be in the, the Christmas parade. No one cares. They're not going to join your church because of that. It's going to require members to do personal witnessing. Uh, it's going to be where the rubber hits the road. Um, so we didn't get into all this, but, but this apathy towards churches is even higher when you get into the younger generations. Uh, so I, refer I just referenced Barna. Here's a study they did 19 or 2017, so it's already kind of dated. Uh, but they asked a bunch of Americans under the age of 30 um, a couple of agree or disagree questions. So here's the percent that agree. Agree or disagree, belonging to church is important. What percent of Americans in 2017 under the age of 30 would agree with that statement? Would you guess? Less than 20. Bingo. <laughs> You made it by one point. Yep, 19%. So only one in five Americans under the age of, uh, of 30 think going to church is important. This is even more fascinating. Agree or disagree, churches do more harm than good. Percent of Americans who would agree with that. One in three of young Americans would say churches, they, they promote misogyny, you know, hatred towards women, all male pastors. They promote uh, 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 bigotry against people with, uh, they, 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 they confuse standing up for principles of God's word with bigotry or with hatred or with prejudice, um, which is, we say, well, that's their fault. No, it's our fault for not communicating better. 
Uh, um, but they, they view churches negatively. And you say, yeah, but that's different. You know, we're, we're in conservative Wisconsin. I find it fascinating how Wisconsinites view Wisconsin. So Barna has studied how religious states are. They define very religious as you go to church at least once a month. So in Barna's, that's, that's very religious. You go to church at least once a month. Of the 50 states with that definition, where would you guess Wisconsin ranks? Go ahead, throw out a number. It'll, it'll be okay if you look bad. Huh? In the middle? In the middle? Wait, who, who, here thinks, who here thinks we'd be in the top third? Who here thinks we'd be in the middle third? Who here thinks we'd be in the bottom third? We're 45th. California is more religious than Wisconsin. If you know the state of California, the northern two-thirds are actually fairly conservative. It's in the south where, where they're a little loosey-goosey. Uh, and, and, and I said the Wisconsinites, and they're like, oh, I don't understand that. Everyone I know goes to church. I was like, yeah, all your church friends. Uh, the reality is Wisconsin is, uh, of all the states in the Midwest, the least religious. Uh, now, I think if you would, t if you would talk about like, um, percent who go on a weekly basis, Wisconsin would have a higher percentage basis than California does. Uh, but the point being, Wisconsin, and we're going to see that when I show you some of the ethnographics for the area. Just the, in your parish area, within 15 minutes of here, the number of people who, who are just unconnected with the churches is, is astronomically high. Um, so we are in a post-Christian nation. Uh, um, it, we, America is following the way of, uh, of Europe. Um, it's been that way for, for a good long, really since World War II, uh, most likely. Uh, um, so again, why is this concerning? Uh, I, I mean, two reasons. We're spiritually concerned. Uh, Isaiah 66, and they will go out and look at those dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched and they will be loathsome to all mankind. I had a pretty deep theological question. Someone asked me, it was, I think it was two consults ago, they said, Pastor Hine, do you think that when it, the Bible talks about the fires of hell, is that literal? I was like, what do you mean? And, and, they, and they noted correctly when the Bible talks about it's, the fires of hell, it typically is in parable or in apocalyptic literature or in prophecy, which can often, all those can be figurative. So they're wondering if the pain of hell is literally that you're on fire. Um, my response was simply, do you want to find out? I'm not 100% certain. I've heard conservative theologians take it both ways. I don't want to find out. Um, we're, we're concerned for the people who, I mean, just think of if you saw someone on fire. What would you do? Like, would you be willing to rip off your coat and, like, pat them out? Would you jump on them and roll them around the ground? Um, as, as you see unbelievers around you in your life, those are people who are this close to being on fire, with the fire that, that is never quenched. Uh, um, so we're concerned, about, we're concerned about that. Organizational concern. Uh, um, just wells in the past five years. So we're averaging, let's just say, about uh, a 1.4 to 1.5% decline. In five years, Wells has lost 24,300 members. I don't know if you're familiar with our sister synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Um, that's about 19,000 people. We've lost the equivalent of the ELS in five years. Um, I was really happy in Charleston, South Carolina. I don't know if you have ever visited. Some people say they visited Charleston, South Carolina. Condé Travelers ranked it the nicest city in the world to visit two years in a row. Beautiful. The Lord was blessing our ministry. Uh, so someone says, why in the world would you take a call to work in the Senate offices in Milwaukee? It's because in 2016, the COP asked me, can you work with a, a demographics group to forecast Wells membership. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And I found out that by about 2070, Wells doesn't exist anymore. We're losing members that quickly. I don't think it would ever cease to exist completely. Uh, um, but we could get to the point where we're like e uh, the ELS, you know, 30,000. And that affects, what, it affects everything we do. It affects our worker training system. You lose 100,000 people, try and keep the worker training system this size intact. Try and do global gospel ministry the way we're doing it if, we, if, we, if, we, if Wells becomes 100,000 people. This whole thing of opening 100 new missions in 10 years, 
That'll be a challenge if we, if we keep losing people at this. Now, it's up to the Holy Spirit, and Jesus told us we're living in the end times where the love of most will grow cold. Um, and, and when I took the call to the Senate offices, I told uh, President Schrader, I'm like, you understand, you're asking me to kind of think of Senate health, and I don't care if the Wells is growing or declining. Um, our motto in congregational services, if we're doing all we can with the gospel, the numbers don't matter. And I'm serious about the last part of that phrase, the numbers don't matter. However, the first part of the phrase I'm, ser phrase I'm serious, are we doing all we can with the gospel? Are we actually doing all we can to retain our straying members, to reach out to the lost, and to build up our current membership so that they become uh, uh, more spiritually mature? If we're doing all we can, the Holy Spirit, if, th if this happens, big deal. But if this happens because we're not doing all we can, that's on us. Uh, 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 um, so, two, two reasons that this, this challenge is concerning. So the reality um, before our church is to get new members, we haven't been able to rely on immigration for 90 years. Um, even after world, around World War I, World War II, we could still count on German immigrants coming over looking for Lutheran churches, uh, uh, um, but we haven't been able to rely on that for, for about 90 years. We can't rely on the birth rate, uh, um, very large families. Uh, there was a study uh, um, that was done many, many, many years ago, and it was just estimating, but they estimated post-World War II, 80% of Wells people worked in one profession. What would you guess it is? Farming. Farming. Um, what did farmers have? They typically had large families. Why? Cheaper to have your kid do it than to, than to hire someone. Uh, um, and so some people will ask me, you know, like, do you, you know, the churches back then, I, there, I, I, remember, I remember hearing of churches that had a thousand members and one pastor. Well, I'm like, sure. And they consisted all of like farming families with like six to ten members in the family. And if you talk to any of the old pastors, they'll say they're, they're, those farmers knew their Bible. They may have only had a high school education, but they knew their Bible and their catechism better than today's average member. And so here they're working with their kids out in the field all day. They come home. Mom's got this big spread on the table. Um, now dad opens his Bible and he, and, you know, he does a devotion with his you know, six kids. Does that sound like your average Wells family today? I, I mean, if that was my church, a thousand people with spiritually mature heads of household like that, yeah, I can run a church of a thousand by myself. That isn't what we have today. Um, the birth rate has plummeted in, 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 in the wells. I'll talk about that more in just a little bit. So we can't just say we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna remain stable by having kids. Um, my generation, Generation X, the youngest Generation Xer is now 44 years old. So we've been re completely replaced in, like, let's call it prime baby-making years by the millennials. Wells has fewer millennials than we do Generation Xers. And millennials have half as many kids as do Generation Xers. Um, five years ago, Wells, overall in the Synod, had 3,000 more births than we did deaths. Last year, we had 1,000 more deaths than we did births. The birth rate has cut in half in Wells in five years, which means if that doesn't change, our Lutheran education system, elementary schools, collapses as we don't have kids to, to fill those schools. It, it'll take, take a while, take a decade, uh, but a challenge that we're facing. We can't count on church shoppers because there are fewer of those each year. So where will our new members come from? You know, the reality is churches are going to make it or not by whether we now as church do, which we should have been doing from the beginning, but just rising up every single individual member and say, I have a personal mission field. The person who lives in the house next to me, the person who lives in the house across the street, I'm going to get to know all those people if they have a church home, and if they don't, I'm going to do all I can to witness to them and try and, try and pull them in, in, into visiting our church. So we talked, then, that was the challenge we talked about yesterday, then we talked about the pyramid of congregational health, and we said how just like with um, assessing a person's health, you look at a zillion different things. In a church, there's a bunch of things to work uh, uh, to look at. The foundation, of course, is God's word and sacrament. If you, if you don't have uh, the word taught in its truth and purity, um, you can build a club, you can build an organization, but you can't really build a church, uh, not something that's going to stand for time and eternity. Uh, that requires God's word and sacrament. On top of that comes what we call congregational culture. 
which we defined as the thought habits of the group, the, the attitudes, the traditions, the customs, the thought habits of the group that influence why the church does what it does or why the church doesn't do what it should do. Um, congregational culture. We said it's the second most important thing after word and sacrament. You get above that, you got strategy and tactics. So strategy is uh, uh, um, like how are we going to reach the community? Are we going to do uh, preschool? Is that? And then tactics, what's the right way to run the preschool? So strategy is doing the right things. Tactics is doing the right things the right way. Uh, but more important than any of those is congregational culture. Um, I don't care how good a plan you have. If you don't have the right thought habits within the congregation, uh, um, it's, it's hard for that plan to be, to be properly uh, implemented. One slide from yesterday that I'll repeat uh, that, that kind of just illustrates the importance of culture. So I had the group bet on two high school football teams. Uh, so here you have Team A. You can see, um, you know, so they have a future uh, uh, Division I quarterback. They got a bigger offensive line. They have a more experienced coach. They have 42 plays on the book, which is a lot for high school. Team B, they have a decent high school quarterback, but he's not as good as Team A. Smaller offensive line, newer coach, only 17 plays on the book. Who would vote for Team A if you were, if you were betting? Who would vote for Team B? Everybody, everybody, no one puts their hand up. because like, he's tricking us. You're, yeah, you're right. Uh, um, two other, t team A, most players are lazy. They don't really care because they think high school is for, for partying, for drinking beers. Team B, all the players work hard and they want to win state more than anything else. Which team do you vote for now? Team B, right? Strategically, Team A is much better positioned. And you know they're going to get crushed by Team B because Team B has healthy culture. Same thing with churches. It's not so much the strategy and the tactics, it's the congregational culture, the thought habits within the group. And so we looked at examples of healthy congregational culture, like a culture of curiosity, where you're welcome to new ideas, a culture of selflessness, that you're, you think about others. You don't, it's not me, me, me. I want the church to do this for me, 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 but it's how can I serve the church? And we looked at examples at, of unhealthy congregational culture. Uh, so we had a commercial that I showed yesterday um, where I just said, healthy or unhealthy church, and how would you, how would you, uh, 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 characterize their culture. Here's the follow-up commercial to it. Hopefully this sound will work okay like this. Something is wrong. Hang on just one sec. Sunday rolls around, I'm tired. So how about a church service that starts when I get there? Can do. When you arrive, we begin. This guy, he plays by his own rules. We want to find a church where if he starts screaming, we're not the bad guy. Right? Say no more. If your baby's screaming, you stay seated. The others around you can leave. You know, financially, Sherry and I don't give a lot to the church. But we'd sure like to know who does. All right, if you join now, you'll know what every person gives in detail. When I'm in the church service, can my car get a buff and a wax? Not just that, but an oil change and a tune-up. Hey, how about tickets to the Super Bowl? That's asking too much. I'm serious. If I'm going to join, I want tickets to the big game. All right, you join now, and we'll get you there. I like a pony. Look in your backyard. Me Church, where it's all. Healthy or unhealthy congregational culture? How, how would you characterize it? Selfish, consumeristic, which, which I see a lot. Uh, um, church members say, the, the church needs to give me the type of church. You better worship the way I want to worship. You better worship at the times I want to worship. You better conduct youth group exactly the way I want it. Uh, it it's consumerism, and it's a, it's, a, it's a toxic type of congregational culture. 
Uh, so we looked at, at that and we asked the church to, to uh, the, the group, to give us then examples of what they think is healthy congregational culture here at Trinity. And there was five breakout groups and you know, I had to, I had to like, consolidate some of them. Uh, but what came out, number one, was gospel confidence, which we summarized as just saying, uh, the members at Trinity trust that God will do what he wants through his word, that he, he accomplishes everything through his word. Uh, tied with that was hospitality and friendliness. Uh, um, that the thought was, if someone walks in, they're going to be warmly welcomed here. Uh, uh, um, that that they'll be followed up on. That people will will greet them and and, and befriend them. Um, won't, they won't be like a ghost just walking in. That 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 no one no one says hi. Uh, um, close behind that was compassion. Uh, we define compassion as genuine care for your fellow members. So that you would do for them what you would maybe do for kin, um, like a brother or a sister. So let's say. Uh, a, a female member of Trinity, uh, a mother goes, is get, got cancer treatment, and now she's recovering at home, and she's going to be down for, for two weeks, that, okay, the members would be happy to bring her, you know, bring her, bring meals over to the family, check on her. So compassion was listed as the third thing. Joyfulness is just positive attitude, which, uh, it's a bitter world, so if you can come to church and people are upbeat and joyful, um, that's a good thing. Uh, supportive of youth education. Uh, was one of them, and then all of these were one. Generosity, um, which is typically financial generosity. Willingness to assess, which you could probably put that higher if you got the synod guy coming in, uh, you're probably willing to assess. And then, and then Christ-centered worship were all uh, one for culture. So, I mean, bottom line is, does this, does this sound right to you? Gospel confidence, hospitality, friendliness, would you say that's part of Trinity's culture, that this is a friendly church? That was the assessment of the group yesterday. Please. So, John, when you say four groups, hospitality, friendliness, mm -hmm. that came out of four of the five groups. Four of the five groups, yeah. Some of them wrote friendly, some of them wrote hospitality. I just kind of put those together because they wrote little descriptions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so t typically what I do is I, I take something where it's close to over half and say if it's over half, that's prob there's probably something to it. Um, if this is true, that compassion, I mean, in, in, this, in, in society right now, this is what people are looking for in their church is that the church will actually help them out. That you'll be more than just acquaintances that where you say, you know, say good morning to people, but you have no clue who they are. Um, that you're actually willing to uh, make sacrifices for your fellow member. Um, that's a strength to build on. Here's what came up as unhealthy cultural traits. In the final report, I mean, there'll be a lot more detail. Like, okay, if this is true, here's how to capitalize on this. If this isn't true, here's how to try and overcome it. Uh, but something that came up consistently was just lack of uh, volunteerism, that it's hard to get more people involved. Uh, it was kind of all over the board as far as the reason for that. Um, some of the groups seemed to put the, the onus on membership. Well, members should be willing to step up more. Others would probably put it on the way volunteerism, the, the, the method for volunteerism, like we'll do time and talent sheets, but then they're not utilized. They just kind of sit on a, they, they kind of sit on the, uh, in someone's office and, and not utilized. Um, but, the, but the thought was that what's sometimes called the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, that 20% of the people are doing about 80% of the volunteer work, um, probably play, plays true here. That was the thought. Uh, inward focus, which is defined as the church um, it's concerned about its own, um, so we'll disciple our kids, we'll have lots of Baba classes, we'll have stuff for members, but as far as like reaching the lost, which is half of the mission of the church, go and make disciples. So half of the mission is to go and pull people into the church, or have the Spirit pull people into the church as you proclaim the gospel, and once they're in, it's make disciples. A church that only focuses on half the mission is not healthy. Uh, um, so inward focus. Um, that we're not focused enough on reaching the lost was what three of the five groups said. Uh, love of status quo is what three of the five, uh, just that it's hard to implement change. Um, there was some, some explanation for that given. It's, it's, it's difficult in church. How old is Trinity? What are you got, 150? 105. 
105. I mean, it, it's easy for me to go to, you know, go to Charleston where we don't have a, when we didn't have a church and we only had 13 people and I can shape the culture from the ground up. It's harder in a church that's 105 years old uh, um, to step back and say, wait a second, maybe we should change A, B, or C. Um, but we've been doing A, B, or C for 40 years. 40 years ago, it was a different world. Different world. Um, and then a bunch of twos. Apathy, uh, um, which is just, we're not really concerned about what happens. Uh, uh, um, just let me come to church, worship, give my offering, and, 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 I'm, and I'm cool. Um, lack of community or clickishness, which is fascinating. Because four of the groups said hospitality was, and friendliness was the thing, compassion was three. But then two of the groups said there's a lack of connection and there's a clickishness. And I'll show you how I use the Pulse survey to kind of assess this, but this kind of came up in some of the Pulse survey responses as well. And then poor communication. And, and here there was a couple of things mentioned. Some was that, um, so again, some of the onus was on the members. Well, our members don't read. The, the announcements, and some of it was on um, how that communication is, is shared. But just sticking at the top, lack of volunteerism, inward focus, love of status quo, let's stick with the top. Does that kind of ring true? Now's the time, just, just to be honest, we're all friends here. You gotta, I know these congregational co uh, consults, they're a bit like a proctological exam. They're not entirely comfortable, but they're necessary. So does this kind of ring true? Yes. yes. All right. And we will talk in the final report how, you, how you, there's, ways, there's ways to deal with all of those, those that are fairly, those are not that, that, that challenging. Uh, um, there's ways to deal with them. So after then, we assessed congregational culture, we moved on to strategy. And we talked about with strategy, what you're talking is a commitment to the mission, the dual mission of the church. That we, yes, we, we just said, well, preach the gospel. To whom? The world. Okay, let's, let's define, what do we mean by the world? And we break it into, finally, the only, the only, there's only one division of people that matters. We said, black and white, who cares? Rich and poor, who cares? Uh, red state, blue state, who cares? What's the only people group that matters to us? Some people, were, please. Believers. Believers and unbelievers. That's going back to Isaiah's fire thing. That's the only, you guys aren't going to be on fire. Unbelievers are. So that's the group. We, so we proclaim the gospel to those two groups, to believers to build them up, to unbelievers so that they can escape the fire, that they can, they can come to faith. So we talked about mission. We talked about vision, which is just, you can't, you have to set a target uh, uh, to, 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 that's down the future because you can't hit a target that doesn't exist. So where would we like to be in three to five years? What would we like to be different, better, improved, more aggressive in, when it comes to gospel ministry? We talked about mission, we talked about vision, and then we just talked about goals, which are just uh, long-range desired outcomes that we think would help uh, achieve, achieve that vision. Um, so I, I, I'm only going to share two. Uh, uh, mission statement. They were all good. I mean, but this what the goal wasn't to write a mission statement. It was just to see if the groups got it, and they did. Uh, so we, the members of Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church, will share the saving grace with the teaching and preaching of the gospel of God's gospel uh, with the Waukesha community. So some things that jumped out at me, uh, they included the personal pronoun we. Um, How is that different than just saying Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church will? If you cut out the personal pronoun, if, like if I was a member of Trinity, I could say, oh, good Trinity. I'm glad we're doing that. We're sharing the gospel. Go Trinity. The fact that you put we in there means that this is a personal statement. You're saying, if I join Trinity, this is what I do. I share God's saving grace through teaching and preaching. I would have probably not used those words because this, to me, people hear that and they think that's what teachers do and this is what pastors do. Um, I would have just put me put sharing of God's God, because that's what we all do, uh, with, within the Waukesha community, which would imply believers and, un, actually, I don't, I don't know why I wrote Waukesha. I, I, I know why, because I was writing this at 11 o'clock last night. We're in Watertown, correct? <laughs> I live in Waukesha. Uh, um, that was um, a glass of wine at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, um, another mission statement, the mission of the members of Trinity is to connect people uh, for, to Jesus for this life and, and for salvation. So again, making it uh, individual, the members of Trinity, and people is pretty broad. You could have put believers and unbelievers, uh, um, but it's fine just to say people, that's believers and unbelievers. 
uh, for this life, so we want their life to get better now, um, and we want them to avoid the fires for eternal salvation. So uh, the, group, the group got it. The dual aspect of mission, we proclaim God's word to believers and, uh, and unbelievers. Uh, moving on to vision and goals, those kind of go together. Uh, there's three things that the group seemed to focus on, so, you know, as far as vision. How will we be different in five years? Uh, um, people had strong evangelism emphasis that, that Trinity is going to be a church that really gets after it. It's going to take a while. You just don't flip that switch. It takes a while. Uh, but, but we're all, and it's something that, that isn't just what leadership does, but that all members do. Uh, so things that people then put down as goals, which are desired outcomes that would help you achieve that achieve that vision. Um, they'd like a detailed written plan. That was one group. Just we got we got to put this on paper. Uh, what exactly are we going to do for evangelism each and every year? Uh, stress and praise personal witnessing efforts. Um, going back to what I said before, y y there, there's a place for corporate outreach because like mass mailings and stuff like that. Um, they'll always there'll always be some church shoppers in America, but less and less and less and less and less and less and less. You know, what, what I find typically, like when I, when I hear a member, like I saw it in the Pulse service, someone will say, why don't we like advertise in the newspaper? Maybe I've just grown cynical. There's a part of me that says, here's why they, they want the church to advertise in the newspaper. Because if the church advertises the newspaper, what, is, what about them then? There's nothing for them to do. Well, I support evangelism because I support our church and our church advertises in the newspaper. So I, now I don't have to step outside my comfort zone and ask my next door neighbor if they have a church home. Um, to the, if it would help avoid that, I would encourage churches, don't do any corporate outreach. Just tell your members. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll put this challenge on you. I've done this the last couple of weeks because we're getting close to Christmas. Christmas Eve has surpassed Easter by far. Like Americans, we used to say they would go, we call them Keister Christians, Christmas and Easter Christians. They don't even go to Easter anymore. Unchurched Americans don't care about Easter. They go to Christmas Eve. I think they think that Santa's going to be there or something like that. So they're not going for the, but they, they love the sentimentality of Christmas Eve. They love singing Christmas carols. Barna did a study, four out of five unchurched Americans will come to a Christmas Eve service in, if invited by someone they trust. Every single person here, what do we got, maybe 100 people? If every single person here would say, I'm going to invite someone to Christmas Eve, the stats would say you would have 80 unchurched people show up on Christmas Eve. Do it. Don't make excuses. Well, I'm scared. Jesus will give you the strength. He says he'll give you the words to say. Just everybody right now say, I'm not going to make any excuses. I'm going to do it. If you say I'm not going to do it, I would humbly ask you to email me, jonathan.hein at wells.net, and tell me why you're not going to do that. This is where it's at in the future. Personal witnessing. Maximize outreach potential of the ECE, uh, early childhood education and school, through use of an aggr aggressive harvest strategy. That if you have unchurched, uh, we, we just stressed, if you have unchurched people who make use of your school or preschool, they're not going to join the church just because they like the preschool. Um, there has to be uh, what's, what's called a harvest strategy. Where, and, and typically, um, I think it requires three touches a semester. Uh, a pastor, a teacher, and then, and then a church member visiting the unchurched parents and explaining to them how you love having their kids in the school, but you're really, as a parent, not really doing your job fully if you don't have your kids connected more, more regularly to the church, home devotion, things like that. Uh, so, okay, perfect. Let's, let, I think uh, ECEs and schools can serve as outreach. Um, but we, we talked about yesterday, that only happens if there is an aggressive harvest strategy. Otherwise, you're just going to have a transactional relationship of people who pay to use your, 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 your preschool, but they're never going to consider your church. Make better use of technology for witnessing. Not, not, uh, we've seen ways to do that during COVID. And then the thought was some community activities, just get, get known out in the community. So uh, this was something, and, and all these things, I can share ideas with how to do this. Uh, programs or training materials that we have, for example, uh, personal witnessing. We have a program that helps with this. So this was a vision that five years from now, there's going to be a strong evangelism emphasis within all Trinity's active members. You can't, you're not going to get every single member to do this because, let's be honest, we have inactive members as well. But if you're an active member, this is just something. This is part of who, what we are, part of what we do. 
Another vision was increased discipleship efforts. So I'm going to call, define this as like raising the expectations for what it is to be an active member. Um, so some of, the, some of the goals there. Elders work, work to get drifting members back. Um, you guys have bounced back some from COVID. Still got a little, little, little ways to go. Um, but a good rule of thumb, something to shoot for, I think, is, is 50%. Um, that you want to have 50% of members in church on, on any given Sunday. Otherwise, the whole message of, you know, we, it's really important to be connected to the means of grace. People hear that and they're like, well, the church isn't serious about that because we only have 30% of our members in church on a Sunday and, and, and we're not really pursuing them that aggressively. 50% um, is a good target. Uh, salt groups, which I forget what that stands for, uh, but it was a lot of uh, smaller Bible study groups. What is that? Sharing and what? Okay, st st yeah, st yeah, studying, that's it. Studying and learning, learning together groups. Uh, yeah, small group activity is a great way to, to create connections within the church. Um, and if it's for Bible study, it's great. There's other things that small groups can do, even just recreational fellowship, um, to, to ha have many opportunities for that, to create connections within the church is good. Uh, just better volunteerism practices. Uh, just think through how, how do we approach... Um, getting people to volunteer. I think a big part of things that came up in the uh, Pulse service was better, quicker implementation and more training for people uh, who are gonna volunteer. Uh, mentoring program for new members. Um, I gotta be a little careful. I think that's a great idea. I gotta be a little careful with that. Like you don't necessarily wanna know like, okay, you just joined so you're on probation for six months. Uh, uh, um, but, but that if you're a new member that there's someone um, an elder or another member who, who just every week is checking in on that person just to see how they're doing, to see if they're in church or not. If they're not, give them a call and ask why. Uh, that's that's a, a fantastic idea. Um, family ministry and intergenerational ministry, those both got brought up. I just put them, put them together. Um, but but uh, um, good ideas. Intergenerational ministry, we're going to see the two largest growing groups in your parish area are those under the age of four and those older the age of 75. Uh, um, that's in this community, that's, that's the, the, the demographics where they're growing. And then and one group had embracing virtual connectivity, 50% uh, in person, 50% virtual. Um, I don't know what to think about that because that's kind of new. There's part of me that worries that with the, with the virtual, those people, it becomes easier to drift. Um, but maybe, maybe uh, you'll have a, a program that, that, uh, that prevents that. Um, but just acknowledging that some people are going to continue to watch um, online was something. Then the final uh, vision thing that I heard uh, more than one group bring up was just better operational practices, just how Trinity runs in, in general, uh, organization. Um, there was encouragement to communicate in a way that reached members. Uh, simple recommendation here, if you put an annual plan together, um, we're pretty detailed, here's what we're going to do for the year. You just have quarterly open forums. Um, they can replace voters meetings just every every quarter in place of Bible class you have an open forum and you say here's what we've done over the last three months here's what we're gonna do over the next three months here's what's going well what's your guys uh, you know how do you guys think things are going uh, just communication in, in those type of ways so that members feel uh, that they have a voice uh, uh, in how things are going allow for two-way communication I just kind of tip my hat at the open forum uh, and then ideas for how to pull in the next generation of leadership. Uh, it, it struck me yesterday, we had, I don't know, 50 people. I think I was the fourth youngest. And I'm not young. Uh, um, how do we pull in the, the next generation of leaders? Uh, um, that's something to, something to think about. Uh, what, can, what can happen sometimes is younger generations can just think, that I don't have a voice here. Um, people who kind of been running things for you know 15 years, they're just they have they kind of know this is the way we want to do it, and I'm not going to have a voice here, and so they kind of disconnect. Um, how do how do we rectify that and get more voices, including the next generation, uh, involved? That was strategy. And the final thing we did was tactical brainstorming, which was just. Uh, um, that's what the group is, is doing right now. Uh, they had a sheet where they were just recommending, let's, let's try this ministry idea, this ministry idea. Um, everything from worship to, to teen group to facility, it's just where they were able to share lots of ideas. I'll, I'll summarize those in my final report. Any questions about the goals? What time, do we, what time are we going to, Pastor? 9, 10, 15? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll be done by about 10. Any, any questions? 
And other things that I'll include in the report, um, stuff that you guys have seen, the, the, the next steps, um, you know, I'll, do, I'll provide some, my office does statistical analysis. So uh, here's something, this is Trinity over the last, uh, I started in 2000, so the last uh, 20 years. So you can see membership and worship attendance. And you know, you, you, this is something that I guess I'd highlight. Um, you know, here's the drop during COVID. Um, dropping down, but I mean you've had years when I say the goal is 50% you've had a lot of years where you've been above that um, I mean look at like here 2001 um, Close to 60% of your people in worship on it. That's something to something to work for It's just one sign of a vibrant church is percent of people in in in, in worship um, Do you notice anything about the general direction of things? Over the last 20 years yeah, and I, I don't show this again to, to like, this isn't to cause panic. It's just, it, you, 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 sometimes the ostrich needs the head out of the sand. And just to say, okay, th this is the potential reality. Uh, um, this is based on the past 10 years, uh, which you know, only the Lord knows the future. So how, how do we forecast, you know, forecast the future? We, all we can do is look at the past and say, well, if nothing would change, uh, um, so it would be the same trajectory, what would it mean? 10 years from now, membership of 435. 20 years from now, membership of 265. Uh, um, again, that's not to cause a sense of panic. And, and if we're doing all we can with the gospel, the numbers don't matter. It's just to clarify the reality that, that there's, uh, there should, I would encourage you to have a sense of urgency. Um, it's time for us to do all we can to reach out to the people of Watertown and try and pull them, pull them into this church. Uh, if, that's, if this comes true again, it's, if we've done our best, that's totally fine. Um, wh where is this coming from? Something I, I, t I look at is different types of gains and losses. So um, there's three different types. There's transfers, ins and outs, which is, it affects like a church. It doesn't really affect the kingdom. Um, but members, you know, other wells members who transfer in versus transferring out. There's life cycle gains and losses. That's um, deaths versus births. Um, so if you know if you had a ton of kids being born, and, and, and uh, um, that can cause the church to grow. To me, the big thing is spiritual gains and losses. So a spiritual gain would be like an adult confirmation or an affirmation of faith. So this is someone who wasn't wells, but through witnessing of some sort, they were pulled into our church. Spiritual losses would be things, I don't count excommunications, because excommunication is actually a good thing. Uh, church discipline is a good thing. But I'm talking about like pe people who just kind of drift away and we don't know where they go, or people who transfer to a church that's not of our fellowship. So like they quit wells to become non-denominational. Um, or people who just say, I'm quitting church altogether. I'm, I, I just don't think church is important, uh, so I quit, quit, quit altogether. Uh, um, so in, in the last decade, um, transfers, you're kind of close to even. You've gained 114, had 114 transfer in, 171 transfer out, so you're, you're net uh, down 57 um, in the last decade. Life cycle, uh, um, that's actually better than a lot of older churches. I mean, I've seen churches where, um, you know, their, it, their death rate is five times that of their birth rate. Here it's a little close to, close to even. Get, you've had 71 births in the last uh, decade. Um, infant baptisms anyway, and, and, uh, and 82 deaths for a net 11. Um, spiritual gains and losses, 26 adult confirmations, affirmations of faith in the last decade, uh, 80 of those other types of losses, like going to other churches that aren't wells, those type of thing, for a net 54. Um, based on your guys' vision, um, what you said is, here's the one that we're focusing on, which is Great, because this one, we don't, it, it's hard, there's, it's just hard uh, 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 to deal with. This one, I don't know what you do. I mean, you can hand out like a bottle of Chardonnay and a Barry White CD to your young members and, and hope maybe there's more babies that are made. Uh, um, but uh, he, here's the one where we really, we really, uh, um, we can try and do something, which is be aggressive in, in our outreach efforts. Um, I'll provide you uh, um, an analysis of your guys' pulse survey. So uh, you see, it's just interesting, 63% of the people responded have been members for more than 20 years. Um, and I'm able to break it out, like I'm able to do, run a query where I just say, oh, okay, I, I want to find people who've been a member for less than five years. Uh, but most of the respondents are people who were, for that, to that, were people who've been here for a long, long time. 
Um, in your opinion, what potential does the congregation have for growth? Uh, um, f half of those people, and these would be long-standing members, say good. Um, about 30% say limited. Um, we got 17% optimists say excellent. And then we got 3% of uh, negative Nellies say almost to none. Uh, so good, at least there, you know, there's some optimism here. Um, I, I would say it's, it, it is good. It is good or better than good, uh, just based on the demographics. Uh, but here's something, again, the example of then what we have to do to change congregational culture. We have to be marketing our church. When the paper has listing of churches, say, example, for Easter, and we're not in there, I wonder why. The answer is because it won't do any good. It won't really gain you members to market your church in the paper on Easter. That, that's, if I can get just that point across... Marketing, just get, don't worry about marketing the church. You could do that in the 60s and the 70s when America had a lot of church shoppers. We don't have that anymore. So you want to get a lot of people to Easter, you know how you do that? The challenge I gave you for Christmas Eve, you do the same thing for Easter. Every member says, I'm going to bring someone along to Easter. Don't, it, take, take the money, and whoever brings the most, you're going to spend on advertising, whoever gets the most people to come, have them take their friends out for dinner. Uh, better, better use of the dollars. Uh, among the people, this is interesting, the people that you consider close church friends, how many would you say are members of this church? None to some to only a few. Almost nine out of ten. So when people say we need to work on increasing connectivity within the congregation, that would be borne out in the Pulse survey. Uh, uh, um, most was only 10%, all or almost all was only 2%. Almost 90% said none, some, or only a few. So our friends, now don't get me wrong, I think it's good to have friends that are outside the church, specifically people who are unchurched and unbelievers. It is good to have unbelieving friends so that you can be salt and light. Uh, but to have very few or none of your close friends be church members, uh, that's something that, that we, can, we can try and focus on moving forward. I, I, this is way too small for you to read. This is more for me to be able to uh, 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 um, summarize, focus that a little bit so I can read it. But I ask you to prioritize aspects of congregational ministry. So serving members with word and sacrament was number one. Telling children about Jesus in the Bible was number two. Way down here, outreach evangelism of non-Christians and, and de-churched Christians. Is this is actually the way you prioritize things. What's going to happen to Trinity? That slide that I showed you? This is it. If you say way down the... Because you're, you're expending so much emotional energy and volunteerism power that if evangelism is way down here, that slide just continues. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that any of these things are unimportant. I'm just saying this is, this is half of the mission of the church and uh, it was way, way down there. Uh, same thing with, this is uh, prioritizing, prioritizing the pastor's time and ministry. Again, you guys can't read it, so I'll summarize it for you. Prepping sermons, conducting worship, and ministering sacraments, that's, that's number, number one. Teaching adults in, in Bible study, that's number two. Teaching children about Jesus, that's number three. Way down here at number nine, training adults to serve God and neighbor. What does that tell you is the, is the, is the mindset of how ministry is done in the church? Who does it all? It's all the pastors and called workers. Even to the point that he's the one who teaches children? In the biblical, let's just take the biblical model. Why was Jesus so excited? Christmas story. Why was Jesus so excited? The 12 year old boy, Jesus, why was he so excited to be in the temple at 12 years old? Remember that story? Doing his father's business, but why else was he excited? It was the first time he was allowed. You didn't get to go into the temple until you were 12 years old. You. A four-year-old did not have access to the priests or the rabbis. The parents did. They taught the parents, and then the parents taught the children. That's the biblical model of how we... Again, I'm not saying anything against having... I like children's sermons, pastors doing devotions in the school. Those are great things. I'm just saying this model, where the, one of the last things the pastor does is train people for ministry... 
And all these things then are things that he has to do. You greatly decrease the spiritual impact that Trinity can have. The Ephesians 4 model we talked about. God gave some to be prophets, apostles, pastors, and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service, works of ministry. So the, the biblical model is the pastors are the ones who equip members to do gospel ministry, not the ones who do it all on behalf of the members. Uh, this is something, again, in your vision that we're going to change. So please share how many persons or families you invited to visit the church or attend worship service in the last year. 90% had none to one to two. Five years from now, for your active members, it's going to be more than 10. For 90% of your active members, which will probably be about 40% of your membership, they'll be able to put more, more than 10. Um, that, that'll be a, a you know, goal, goal that we have. Finally, I'll do some demographic in that report, some demographic uh, analysis. So here is your, what, what I called your parish area. This is the 15-minute drive um, from where we are uh, kind of buried right there. Um, Mission Insight, does it, this would, they would call this moderate growth. Uh, does this sound about right, that it, it, within 15 minutes from here, it looks like that would be about 33,000? Does that sound about right, 15 minutes from here? They're expecting it to go to about 36,000. Um, that's, a, that's a couple thousand people in just a decade. Um, so they're calling this moderate growth. Um, granted, it's, <laughs> it's where we have other Wells churches, uh, um, but that, that, still within 15 minutes, Trinity could reach those people as well. So it's, it's not, some people, someone said yesterday, it's a completely flat area. Um, actually, for the state of Wisconsin, growth in this area is, it's not as good as it is, um, like say, in the Brookfield area, but, but it's, it's decent. Um, this is the thing I was talking about earlier. Uh, uh, involvement of re in a religious congregation or community, uh, within 15 minutes, 60% of the people are not involved with the church. So take, what did we say it was, 55, let's just take 50,000 times 60. That's 30,000 people who are within 15 minutes of this church that don't have a aren't involved with the church right now. Go get them. Not your pastors, you. They'll help. You go get them. Uh, uh, only 40% that, that are involved. Um, ten, phase of life, 10 year, ten year change. Uh, here's what we said that um, big group, big growth in zero to four, so that bodes well for, pre, not big growth, but uh, about 3%. Uh, closer to 4% is 65 and older. So a lot of times churches just think, well, we need to stay. ministry to pull in young people, ministry to pull in young people. It, of those 30,000, I guarantee you, there's a lot who are old. And so they're probably, like, death necessarily isn't on the mind of a four-year-old. It's on the mind of someone who's 74. And if they don't have a church home, that is low-hanging fruit. A 74-year-old who doesn't have a church, for, church home? Um, I just ask, what do you think is going to happen to you in the next decade? You ready for what you're about to face in the next decade? Um, good conversation to have. Uh, you can say it nicer than that. Um, this is fascinating, and I'll include this in the, uh, this is the ethnographic. So Ministry Insight, they subscribe to groups like Experian, these other companies that spend a ton of money uh, doing survey work uh, about like preferences. It's, it's mostly for marketing for businesses, but they also do it for nonprofits, including churches. Um, so what this is, is, again, too small a text, but it says ratio. So there's these various things that might be important when, for someone who is unchurched, they would ask, do you have a church home? If not, they would say, okay, if you're considering a church, would this be important or unimportant to you? And then the ratio is the, the number of people who said important versus unimportant. So warm and friendly encounters that I come into church and I'm welcomed and people like want to get to know me, 5.9 ratio. So for every six people who said that was important, only one person said that's unimportant, which just tells me if a church isn't warm and friendly right now in this, in this parish area, they're done. In your culture thing, you said, yeah, we are a warm and friendly church, okay? Uh, let's make sure, quality sermons, 3.3. So for every three and a half people who said, yeah, that's important, it's only one person who said it's, Unimportant, which is fascinating. I want to talk to that guy who says, yeah, I wouldn't care about the quality of the sermons. Um, traditional worship experiences. Strong preference for every two people who said that was one important, one person said that was unimportant, as opposed to uh, way down here, contemporary worship experiences, it's, the, it's flipped. 
And a lot of times I work with churches and they just think, oh, if we just go to contemporary worship, God's kingdom will come. In this particular parish area, most people would say, no, we would prefer a more traditional, more traditional worship services. Um, but I, I'll, I'll bring up other things that, to note of here. For example, religious education for children. Most people here would say that's unimportant. Which you say, well then, we, we can't advertise the school. That's not true. I think you know, across America, people are concerned about what's happening in schools. But what are they concerned about? Does the teacher actually care for my kids? Because it seems like all they care about is sitting at home and doing things virtually. You guys' school stayed open, oh, I, I think, right? You stayed open. So you can advertise. Our teachers care for your kids. Um, our teachers are going to talk about how God loves all people. We're not going to talk about how this, this group of people is bad, this group of people is victims. God loves all people. That we're all victims of sin. Um, we're all guilty of sin. We all have a say. But my point is you're advertising not so much come and get Christian education, but come and get good education where the parents care for your kids. And then, by the way, you're going to share Jesus with them and you're going to also have a harvest strategy for the parents. I'll go through all this and say here's what makes sense based on when, when you said here's, here's something we want to do. You said you want to use the school for outreach. Okay, just realize in your parish area, people, they don't care about it being Christian. They care about it being quality. So not that you don't you hide that you're Christian. Obviously, we're Trinity Lutheran School, Trinity and St. Luke's Lutheran, right? Uh, right, Lutheran School. Uh, uh, um, but you advertise it's also quality education with teachers that would do anything for, anything for your kids. Uh, so the next steps, I'll produce the final report, um, a summary of what was heard, uh, provide recommendations for prioritized goals, provide suggestions for tactics that achieve that goals, and then it's up to congregational leadership. Um, to, to action plan that out. I can help with that, or you can say, no, we got it, we're, we're good. Uh, who, what, and when. Uh, just final wrap up, our responsibility. This is a, an amazing passage. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Today, an ambassador is not important because we have the internet, we have phones, it's not important. When Paul wrote these words, you couldn't talk to someone 600 miles away. So an ambassador had all the authority of the king. And that's what King Jesus says you are. You have all of his authority, that he is going to make his appeal through you. He doesn't say as though God is making his appeal through pastors. God's making his appeal to the world through us. We're all in battle. That's a huge responsibility. And yet Christ says, I'm going to give you words of wisdom uh, that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. That Jesus never asks us to do something that he doesn't give us the power to do. So when he tells Peter, come and walk on the water, the reason Peter can walk on the water is because Jesus told him to. When Jesus says to Lazarus, who's been dead and stinking for four days, come out of the tomb, he's able to do it because Jesus asked him to. Likewise, when Jesus asks you to be his ambassador so that God can make an appeal to your next door neighbor through you, he's going to give you the ability to do what he's asked you to do. A little over time. Thank you very much, guys, for your time. Thank you, Pastor Hein, for your service to us so far and in the future. Have a blessed Christmas, and seriously, try that. Invite. I would love for you guys to tell me after Christmas. We had 50 guests show up because our members invited someone. They will come to Christmas Eve.